Okay, everybody, welcome back to your third and final talk today. It's from Annie Murphy Paul. So, Annie is an acclaimed science writer whose work has appeared in the New York Times, Scientific American, and the best American science writing, among many other publications. Her latest book is The Extended Mind, The Power of Thinking Outside the Brain. Published in June of 2021, it was selected as an Amazon editor's pick for best nonfiction, one of 50 notable works of nonfiction by the Washington Post, and one of 100 notable books of 2021 by the New York Times. She is the author of Origins, also named by the New York Times as a notable book, and The Cult of Personality, healed by Malcolm Gladwell in The New Yorker as a fascinating new book. Her TED Talk has been viewed more than 2.7 million times. Annie is a recipient of the Rosalind Carter Mental Health Journalism Fellowship, the Spencer Education Journalism Fellowship, and the Bernard L. Schwartz Fellowship at New America. You can keep up to date with Annie's work at www.anniemurphypaul.com and follow her on Twitter at Annie Murphy Paul. So Annie, it's brilliant to have you with us here and just get going whenever, whenever you're ready. Great. Thank you. Thanks so much for that kind introduction, Niles. And welcome to you all. I guess not. I guess uh, welcome to me. You guys have been here for a while. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the previous uh, lectures today. Today, I'll be talking to you about something called the extended mind, um, which is a theory to emerge out of philosophy. I am actually a psychology writer, um, and I recently, uh, and over the last 10 years or so, have specialized in writing about uh, the science of learning. Um, so philosophy is a bit of a step outside of my usual ambit, but I'll tell you how I got there. Uh, I was, as I say, researching and writing about the science of learning, which I'll admit was a bit of me search in the sense that um, I have two children uh, around the time that I started looking into the science of learning, they were starting school and I was really interested in how they were learning, how their teachers were teaching them. And I discovered as well that the science of learning was this really exciting, dynamic, um, exploding kind of field that um, was discovering so much about how we learn. Um, so I was planning to write a book about the science of learning and collecting lots of research and, and doing lots of reporting on that. Um, but my problem as a writer was that I couldn't find a big idea that was gonna pull together all those threads that I was collecting that, um, that I found so intriguing. And in particular, the uh, aspects of the science of learning that I found most intriguing were those that were a bit on the edge of traditional cognitive science and psychology. I'm thinking of things like embodied cognition, the idea that um, we think with our bodies and not just with our, our heads above the neck, um, situated cognition, the idea that we think differently depending on where we are, that our, our thinking is deeply influenced by our physical surroundings, our environment. And lastly, socially distributed cognition, the idea that thinking doesn't just happen up here, it happens, it doesn't, it doesn't just happen in the brain and it doesn't just happen within the individual. It's a collective enterprise that happens among people. So these were the uh, aspects of the science of learning and the science of cognition that really um, intrigued me. And yet, and I felt that they were related, but I couldn't quite put my finger on how they were connected until I broadened my reading and research a bit and um, came across an article in a philosophy journal written by two philosophers, Andy Clark, who's from Edinburgh actually, and um, or who was uh, at the University of Edinburgh at that time, um, and David Chalmers. Uh, Clark and Chalmers had written this article called The Extended Mind. It was uh, written and published in 1998, introducing their theory of the extended mind. And I was arrested by the, um, the very first sentence of the article, which said, where does the mind stop and the rest of the world begin? Um, and this was a, a provocative question to me, a, a, a thought provoking one, because it would seem to have a very obvious answer, a conventional answer, which is, well, the mind ends at the skull. The mind and the brain are identical. They're contiguous. Um, what more is there to say about that? But Clark and Chalmers argued that this was not the case, that in fact, our thinking processes extend beyond the, the, the brain, the, the, the skull. Um, they reach out into the rest of our bodies into our physical surroundings, into our interactions with other people. 
and the particular focus of that article into our tools and our devices and our technologies. Um, so this was very interesting to me and it, I identified it as perhaps the, um, the big idea that could pull together all these strands of research that I've been collecting. So I wrote a book about the extended mind. I want to say from the beginning, it was not my idea. I borrowed it, um, but I saw in the book to, in a sense, operationalize it, to take this idea that I thought was really too good to leave to the philosophers and their ivory towers and bring it down into real life and to explore what it would mean if we really are thinking with our bodies and our surroundings and our, our relationships? How could we do those things better? Um, so that book, The Extended Mind, came out in June. And I thought I would, um, I have this PowerPoint presentation here, so I should use it. Um, I would guide you through sort of the, um, the, an overview, some of the, an overview of the idea, and then some of the practical applications, which were, as I say, very important for me to, to explore. Um, in this book. Let's get started here. You know, it, 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 to me, the, the question is, is really how do, we, how do we think? How do we tackle hard problems? How do we wrestle with difficult problems and solve them? Um, and the extended mind has an answer for that. And it's different from, as I say, the conventional answer, which um, Andy Clark calls the brain bound approach. And what he means by that is that we typically think of, of thinking as happening within inside the head. We treat the brain as if it's kind of like a workhorse that we need to keep flogging until it produces the results that we want. And there's actually a couple of metaphors underlying the way we think about the brain that are very common. They, are, they, they um, show up in our language all the time. They really color the way we think about the brain and about thinking and about the mind. Um, but we're not necessarily aware of them. Uh, and I think it's a good idea to sort of surface those and talk a little bit about them because I think they're really very deeply misguided or at the very least um, incomplete. And the first of these is that the brain is like a computer. This is a metaphor and analogy that arose in the middle of the last century during the cognitive revolution. And it certainly has um, produced a quite a fruitful a research program in cognitive science, and it's um, led to a lot of, of discoveries and insights. But the idea that the that the mind, that the brain, is like a computer, really is uh, is is unfair to the to the brain in a sense, because our brains are not second rate computers. They are uh, biological organs that have evolved to help us survive. They have a, a, a unique and really incredible kind of human biological intelligence that computers can't even approach. So when we compare our brains to computers, we're really, in a sense, underselling, um, underselling our, our own brains. Um, at the same time, uh, the, the brain evolved to solve problems that are and, and complete tasks that are quite different from what we expect it to do our brains to do today. Um, they didn't really, our brains didn't evolve really to, to um, uh, deal with abstractions and, and concepts and symbols the way we, uh, most of us uh, expect our brains, we expect our brains to do that day in and day out. Really what um, the brain evolved to do is things like move and sense the body, um, navigate through three-dimensional landscapes, interact with other brains, with other people, and the more we can make our thinking resemble those kinds of activities for which the brain is really well suited and which and tasks that it can carry out very efficiently and effectively um, without adding a lot of cognitive load, that's what we want to be doing, not um, pushing the brain to act more like a computer, which um, it, as I say, it's not that sort of deeply misunderstands the nature of the brain to think of it as a computer. And when we compare it to a computer and a computer's perfect memory, for example, we're always going to come up short. Whereas um, there are so many things that the, a computer doesn't have that we have access to, for example, are embodied resources, um, the way that we can use our bodies to understand and express uh, our thinking. So keep that in mind as we go forward, the idea that the analogy of a brain to a computer is, although it's so common, um, it's actually quite flawed. And we want to watch out for that in our, in our daily lives. 
the second analogy I want to talk about is, is more recent um, in a sense. Uh, and I say that because the idea of brain as muscle achieved really wide popularity and wide exposure with the work of a psychologist, a Stanford psychologist named Carol Dweck, who introduced the idea of the growth mindset. And her message, especially to students and children, was a really positive and an inspirational one that the more you work your brain, like a, like a physical muscle, the stronger it gets. I, my reference earlier to, to the question of whether it was new or not is that um, there's actually quite a long history going back even to the 19th century of people, uh, doctors and others analogizing the brain to a muscle. Um, so that, that thread has been there in our culture for a long time. And it's a very appealing metaphor. Um, the idea, you know, as I say, that if you exercise the brain, it gets stronger and there's evidence for that. And yet, again, that is a limiting metaphor um, because it's brain bound in its own way. It, it, it um, locates thinking in the brain and it gives us one strategy, which is to work that brain ever harder. Again, sort of flogging it like like a workhorse. And that can be a very frustrating and limiting kind of strategy for students, for adults. Um, it's not the only one. And that's what the extended mind offers. It sort of opens up a whole range of new strategies and approaches. So let's get on to those. So the analogy um, that I prefer is that the brain is like an orchestra conductor. The brain is still central. I don't to thinking. I don't want to suggest that um, that the brain isn't isn't um, you know the dominant uh, organ involved in thinking. But the brain doesn't do it all on its own. That is the switch that the extended mind, the theory of the extended mind, is making. Um, the brain is more like an orchestra conductor in that it's it's bringing bringing up the string section or you know. Um, toning down the woodwinds, like kind of um, in control and coordinating uh, resources, but not doing everything by itself. And as we'll see, I think that's a more productive metaphor for the brain, a more generative metaphor and a more useful one in our, in our everyday lives. I wanna talk here about the limits of the biological brain. That's an important element to understand um, when we're thinking about the extended mind and why the extended mind needs to exist. And the reason it needs to exist, or we need to be talking about it, is that the biological brain on its own is, is quite limited. It's idiosyncratic. It's quirky. You know, it's, um, we tend to think of the brain as this all-purpose, all-powerful thinking machine. And it's, it's not. It's an evolved organ that um, was designed by evolution to do certain things. And that's, and the gap between what it evolved to do and what we ask it to do is the source of a lot of our frustration in daily life. Um, you know, I noticed that in popular science depictions of the brain, we're always being told that the brain is so amazing. It's so astonishing. It's so incredible. It's the most complex object in the universe, you know, and all these things are true. But uh, as I say, the brain is also quite limited in what it can do. Our, our world is so complex. Our, um, the, not, the amount of knowledge that we have access to is so enormous. Expertise is so specialized. These things, this mismatch between our kind of stone age brain and the modern world that we live in are creating this gap that the extended mind comes in to fill. And I, I do think it's important for people to understand that you know, even as we're hearing about how amazing the brain is, it's, <laughs> I think it can lead some of us, including myself to think, well, why, well, then why, why does my brain not act so amazingly all the time? I forget things, you know, I lose my focus, I lose my motivation, but those are all products of the universal limits of the human brain. And the way to get past those limits, to transcend them is not to again, work the brain harder and harder and expect more and more of the biological brain, it's to help the brain out with some external resources that we can put external to the brain, pull in to help the brain, to help the brain overachieve, to help the brain do more than it could do on its own. I do wanna emphasize that last point that everyone's brain is limited in these ways. This is not about individual differences. This is about the nature of the organ, um, the organ that we all have as it's our legacy as human beings. The brain is amazing. 
the brain is also limited. And that's why the extended mind comes into play. As I've been saying, the limits of the brain, once we get our heads around the fact that the brain is quite limited, idiosyncratic, you know, it evolved to do certain things that are different from what we expect to do, it to do today. We can start thinking about how to extend the brain's abilities, um, its capacities, not by working it ever harder, but by bringing in extra neural resources. In other words, research, resources that are outside the brain. And I've, I think I went over those a, a moment ago, but it's um, good to go over those categories again, because we'll be referring to them throughout this, this lecture. What are those outside the brain resources? Uh, they are our tools and our devices. I think um, we all have the experience, or most of us have the experience of offloading some of our mental functions onto our smartphone, say, you know, we don't remember phone numbers anymore because our smartphones have effectively taken over that aspect of our memory um, and they do it for us and quite well, probably better than we could do it ourselves. So that's an example of extending our minds with technology. The next category of extra neural resources is the body. The body is actually, you know, Western culture teaches us that mind and body are separate, um, but in fact, they are intricately intertwined. And the body is very much a part of the thinking process in terms of the internal sensations that are arising within the body all the time and that affect our thinking. That's a process known as interoception. Interoception is our capacity to sense those internal signs and, and signals, our gestures. I'm gesturing right now. You may not be able to see it because I'm on Zoom, but um, our gestures are actually a part of an active part of our thinking process and our movements. Um, we understand things often by moving our bodies, um, which is a reason that the way we sit still in classrooms and offices when we need to do thinking is, our thinking is really quite, um, it's, it's a misguided idea, but certainly a very, a very common practice. Our, the fourth uh, extra neural resource there is uh, our surroundings, our physical, uh, setting. And this is one place where the brain as computer metaphor is really, really shows itself as, as being quite flawed. You know, a brain, a computer um, works the same way, no matter where it is. This laptop that I'm using to talk to you today, it operates the same, whether it's here in my, in my um, home office or whether I took it to a park, I wouldn't do that today because we just had a giant uh, snowstorm here in, in Connecticut. But um, you know, if I took it outside, it would work exactly the same way. It does, it's not affected by its surroundings. Whereas the human brain is actually exquisitely sensitive to context. You know, we think differently when we're in nature. We think differently when we're in a setting where we feel like we belong and we're welcomed. We think differently when we're among people than when we're alone. So all of these um, aspects of our external uh, surroundings really affect the way we, the way we think and can become a resource for us, or sometimes as we've been saying, a kind of, a kind of detriment. Finally, an, uh, an extra neural resource that we um, don't always see in those terms are the brains of other people. You know, um, we have a very, we live in a very individualistic culture, one that says that thinking happens sealed inside, you know, the bubble of one brain. Um, we tend to valorize, you know, geniuses and innovators who, who supposedly create things on their own when really knowledge and thinking is always a collective process. It's a social process. And uh, although we tend, again, in our culture to separate social life from intellectual life or academic life, actually, we have these very powerful social brains. Again, this is all, all goes back to our evolution as human beings. We have these incredibly powerful social brains. And rather than trying to separate out our social nature and set that aside and save it for recess or lunchtime or a happy hour, I think it's a much smarter idea to try to harness our social nature, to bring that into the classroom and into the workplace uh, and leverage it in, this, in the service of, of learning and, and working. The point I want to be making here is that we are already thinking outside the brain. This is something that, again, ironically, we kind of evolved to do. You know, humans have been using tools um, for millennia. Certainly we've been interacting with others for um, as long as human beings have existed. Thinking outside the brain is sort of what we, we naturally do. 
But on the other hand, our systems of education and workplace training, the way we think about thinking is all about the brain. We're very, very oriented towards cultivating the brain and the specific um, abilities of the brain. We don't really consciously and deliberately teach people how to think outside the brain in a skillful way. So we end up doing it sort of haphazardly without a lot of thought or intention. You know, for example, uh, again, gestures, just to, to pick one at random, we gesture all the time. We gesture spontaneously. We gesture even, you know, when we're talking on the phone and no one can see us, this is, it's, it's a natural sort of outgrowth of, of the way our minds and our bodies work together. And yet how often have we really received instruction and in how to gesture in ways that support thinking? Um, you know, how often are we taught specific gestures that might allow us to think better? Um, how often are we taught how to carefully observe other people's gestures and get thereby get a sense of what they're thinking and where they are in terms of their development or their um, their level of, of grasping a concept? Um, these are all things that are possible once we start thinking about gesture in an intentional, deliberate way from this extended mind perspective. I do believe that, as I was saying before, the, the complexity of our world, the um, quantity of information that's coming at us all the time, the demands we, that others make on us and that we make on ourselves, and frankly, um, how daunting our problems are, how wickedly complex our problems are as a society, really requires us to, um, to embrace the extended mind. That's my belief, that... Um, the biological brain really can't do this on its own. It really can't uh, grapple with um, the issues and the challenges of the modern world. We need to extend the mind to do all that, um, all that's required of us in order to, to meet the moment. Um, we need to learn how to extend the mind and not to try to put it all in the brain, the biological brain. So I thought I'd go through uh, in a little more detail uh, each of these, these external resources that we've been talking about um, and, and offer a few suggestions on how to actually do what I've been saying we should do, which is um, uh, incorporate them into our lives in a much more deliberate and skillful way. So we'll start with interoception, which I briefly mentioned before. That is the capacity to sense our internal signals. And that is a, an ability that we're all born with. Uh, it's how we know that we're hungry. It's how we know that um, we're upset about something or nervous about something. We have these internal um, cues that arise from within the body. But I think when we are, when we are doing academic work or, um, or professional work, we're often encouraged to kind of put those um, bodily sensations aside, to ignore them, to neglect them. Um, and to sort of power through and get the work done. And it's my contention, and I think it's supported by the research, that a much smarter strategy would be to actually deliberately and consciously tune in to those internal signals because they really carry a wealth of information, um, a wealth of non-conscious knowledge that has been that we've that we we take in from the world around us and we store, but don't have conscious access to because, um, that would just use up way too much of our sort of our mental bandwidth of all this knowledge um, was conscious at all times. So then the question is, well, how do we get access to all that non-conscious knowledge that we're storing as we uh, go through everyday life and notice patterns and regularities in our experience? We store those, we store that information and the way we get access to it is the body. You know, that is those uh, internal sensations are in a sense, our body tapping us on the shoulder or tugging us on the sleeve saying, pay attention to this, you know, prepare yourself for this challenge. This is what, this is what has happened before. You know, all these kinds of messages that we may miss if we're pushing those bodily sensations aside. And although there is quite a bit of um, a range in how, how accurately and sensitively people can pick up on these internal signals. For example, some people are able to know with quite uh, striking accuracy when their heart is beating. Maybe you're one of those people, or maybe you're one of those people who has no idea what that even would even be like. As I say, there's quite a, a range in how interoceptively attuned people are, but it is possible to deliberately cultivate the interoceptive sense. One of those 
ways is is the body scan. You may have encountered it if you've if you've done mindfulness meditation. It's often an exercise that starts off uh, a meditation session is the body scan where you're just um, paying attention to your breath and then paying attention, often moving through the body from the feet kind of upwards, um, just paying attention to each um, part of the body in turn and feeling what there is to be felt there in an open-minded, non-judgmental, curious kind of way. Um, and so practicing the body scan on a regular basis has been shown to increase people's interoceptive attunement. Um, another strategy you might try is called affect labeling. And that's just a simple pro um, practice of noticing what you're feeling and giving it a name and not getting into all the reasons why you might be feeling that, but, and really, um, in fact, just focusing on the physical sensation, you know, and describing it with as much granularity as possible, as, as much specificity as possible, and generating as many words as you can, as many labels as possible seems to be uh, an effective approach also. So you might, if you're feeling nervous before a um, giving a public talk, for example, just try label, paying attention, tuning into your internal sensations and labeling each one in turn, you know, butterflies in my stomach, tenseness in my chest, um, palms are sweaty, you know, but, and staying with those physical sensations rather than allowing your mind to spin off into uh, all, all of these sort of emotional ramifications of those things. And doing so has been shown to immediately kind of reduce the activity of our nervous systems. It, it, it has a calming effect just to notice and label exactly what it is that your body is experiencing. Movement uh, is, is another kind of um, activity that we don't usually associate with thinking, right? If, we're, if we have um, hard things to do, if we're solving problems or getting a, a difficult task done, we think we have to sit down and even, you know, kind of keep your butt in the chair until you, until you get it done. That was certainly the way I was, I was raised. Um, but in fact, you know, human beings evolved, again, talking about our evolution again, we evolved to be doing complex mental activity, cognitive activity, and difficult, challenging physical work at the same time. If you think about foraging or hunting, these are things that involve the body very um, intensively, but they're also very cognitively complex and challenging. And humans really evolved to have the, both of those things going on at the same time. Our body, minds and bodies were not really engineered to be sitting still while we are thinking. And in fact, sitting still sends a message to the brain that this is time to relax. And if you've ever found yourself <laughs> sort of drowsing over your work and, and you know, nodding until you, you, you realize, oh my gosh, I'm falling asleep. And, and I'm not saying that's ever happened to me, but, um, but you know that that is sitting still is actually um, can lead us to fall into a kind of drowsy lassitude rather than the kind of alertness that we have when we're moving the body. So, and that doesn't have to mean that we're, um, you know, running a marathon while we're doing our work, we can engage in what are known as micro movements, um, which keep us alert and engaged. And that those tend to micro movements tend to be more common when we're standing. For example, this is an argument in favor of a standing desk, because even just standing on our feet rather than sitting leads us to kind of make these little movements like shifting from one foot to another or moving our arms around. And those can really keep us alert and engaged uh, while we're, we're doing our mental work. Um, another option is to take a movement break just before we, set, we sit, sit down to think. This is one reason why recess is so important for children. Um, in, engaging in brisk physical activity right before you, uh, you learn something or you think through something actually makes your cognitive faculties keener, more acute. Um, and so again, it's a bit perverse that we separate movement from thinking, like we might go to uh, the gym on weekends or at the end of a work day when really we should be trying to build um, epi like spurts of movement into our everyday lives, um, everyday work lives. So um, rather than take a coffee break, you might want to think about taking um, a movement break or even a dance break. I've been hearing um, more and more people who are tired of being on Zoom all day um, say that they will fire up their stereo and just sort of dance around the house for a song or two between meetings, which I think is a great idea and a fun idea. Here we are at gesture again, which is um, 
uh, a favorite topic of mine because I do tend to think with my hands quite a lot. And there's, you know, it's rather a stigma in our culture against um, thinking with our hands. It's thought to be sort of gauche or, you know, um, hand waving is a synonym for like not knowing what you're talking about. When really um, gesture was our, our first language before linguists think that before we ever um, developed spoken language, we were communicating with each other um, with gesture. And we see that recapitulated with every time a child is born. Often um, babies are able to communicate with their hands long before they can put a word to um, a, a spoken word to what they're, what they're thinking or what they're wanting to express. And it's the case that um, all through our lives, gesture stays with us as this powerful mode of of communication. It's a key part of the thinking process. Um, And in fact, it's often a beat or two ahead of our spoken language. And so by moving our hands and capturing some aspect of what we're thinking, we can actually bootstrap our own thinking. We kind of read, read information off our own hands that we are not just not quite ready to express uh, verbally yet. So that's why it's important to sort of give yourself permission and give others permission to move their hands a lot when they're, when they're thinking, working through something. Um, It can be helpful to, um, you know, one thing that we miss out on when we don't see each other in person and we're online and on these kinds of platforms all the time is that sometimes we're just really like a a talking head and we don't see the bodily movements and the gestures of the people that we're talking to. We may also make fewer of those gestures ourselves because we're sitting down. We're not, we know that our hands aren't visible. In fact, gesturing helps our own speech and our own thinking become more fluent and more cogent. So you really want to keep gesturing um, even when you're speaking, doing your thinking and speaking online, and it can help to sort of pull back a bit so that it can be seen by others and by yourself. To that same point, uh, it can be helpful to look for instructional videos, either for yourself or for your children, that involve a lot of um, hand movements by the instructor, um, which is not always the case. Sometimes, again, you get a, a talking head or even just um, just uh, a voice narrating um you know, someone writing, writing on a, a, a whiteboard when you really want to have the full complement of um, human communication, which includes gesture. As I'm saying, it's uh, gestures almost co- comes first in the sense of our, our human history. Okay, so on to um, how the, our surroundings, our physical environment affects the way we think. Nature, the outdoors, are, is one of the most powerful kind of settings in terms of how it affects our cognition. We think so much, or at least I think so much, and I read a lot about this, um, about our attentional capacity being, uh, how how to manage it, how to direct it, how to protect it from being um, distracted, you know? So we're always thinking about putting that attention out there. We don't really think about um, restoring, you know, we think about the, the demand side. We don't think about the supply side. Where is our attentional capacity coming from. It actually has to be periodically renewed because spending time in urban settings or built settings or doing the kind of very intensive cognitive work that many of us do um, or or, um, that we expect of students in in schools uh, really very quickly drains our attentional capacity. It's a limited resource and it needs to be refreshed periodically. And it turns out that the most effective and efficient way to restore our attention is to spend time outside. And that's because again, you're gonna hear this word from me a lot. We evolved to process the kind of information, the kind of stimuli that we find outdoors, um, which is not sharp angles and and fast movements so much as um, lots of gentle noises, diffuse kind of sounds and light and repeating motifs, you know, a a tree that might um, have many leaves shaped the same way, but in different sizes, you know, that's called uh, a fractal pattern. Our uh, sensory capacities really evolved to process that kind of natural information very easily and effortlessly. So we can, and we kind of know this, I think intuitively, when you go outside, it's very easy to let your mind sort of relax and, you know, relax its grip because we can take in all this information in a very effortless way. And what the brain finds effortless, it also tends to find 
it, it, it also reacts to in a positive way. It finds, if it finds it um, very pleasant. So as a result, um, we not only feel relaxed and restored in a natural setting, we also often get a mood boost. Our mood is elevated from being in, in nature. And although being outside um, in full really is, is the ideal, um, we can get some of the same benefits just from looking out a window or even watching a nature video. I, I um, suggest to people that instead of watching the latest TikTok video of, of someone doing something that we actually tune into a nature video of animals or of waves or of nature, because that's um, the kind of break that our, our brain is really looking for and designed for. Just a, a few words about how to arrange our interior spaces so that they support intelligent thinking. The human brain is exquisitely sensitive to context and yet you know, along with this sort of brain as computer metaphor, we expect ourselves sometimes or others expect us to think well anywhere, you know, and I see this uh, trend playing out in the um, the current popularity of what's known as hoteling or hot desking where um, uh, employees are expected to come into an office and just grab whatever desk is available. And it wasn't their desk yesterday and it won't be their desk tomorrow. And I think um, that kind of approach is understandable as it is, uh, as we um, figure out what the future of the office is gonna look like, um, I think really goes against a lot of what we know works for people in terms of what their surroundings are like when they're doing their thinking. Um, there's some um, research to suggest that um, having things around us, objects that are, um, that are cues to, um, identity, which is means that um, what we see around us supports the, the role that we're playing in that particular moment, whether it's as worker or student or a creative person, um, having those cues that remind you who you are, uh, who you are, are actually very helpful to have uh, in your workspace or your learning space. And also cues of belonging, you know, reminders that you are part of a valued group, that you belong in whatever space you're in. And conversely, when those uh, cues of belonging are, are absent, or when there are cues that um, signal to people that they're not welcome, that people like them are not, um, don't belong there, that can be very detrimental to, um, to our thinking because we are such social beings. We are monitoring our, our surroundings for signs about whether we're in a safe place, a supportive place. So as much as possible, we wanna design our schools and workplaces to send those messages to people um, that support their identities, that support their sense of belonging. Cognitive offloading. This is a, a chapter in the book called Thinking with the Space of Ideas, um, which refers to the fact that we really try to do too much in our heads. We have this idea, and it's a very brain-bound idea, that um, smart people do it in their heads, geniuses do it in their heads, and, and adults, you know, grown-ups do things in their heads. Um, we're okay with kindergartners using manipulatives to learn math, but we think we should put those aside as we get older and, and more mature. But in fact, um, getting our thoughts out of our heads and onto physical space, whether that's a whiteboard or multiple a multiple computer monitor setup or um, uh, post-it notes that we can move around and rearrange, that really, um, taps into those embodied resources that I was talking about earlier. When we can treat ideas as if they are a 3D landscape that we can navigate through, use our spatial memory, use our proprioception, that's our sense of where our, our, um, our body parts are in space. Um, and, or when we can use, when we can treat ideas and information like physical objects that we can manipulate, like these post-it notes that we're actually sort of move, physically moving around. We're tapping into all of these embodied resources that um, can help us think and that remain dormant when we keep all our thoughts you know, inside our own heads. The final chunk of the book is about um, a kind of about creating the conditions for collective intelligence, you know, thinking with other people and not imagining that um, thinking is an individual process, you know, that happens in separate isolated uh, brains. We ought not to separate social life and mental life as much as we do. Um, we should look for ways to harness the social brain. And I've listed here three ways that are particularly effective at harnessing the social brain. And those are storytelling, 
finding ways to turn the information that we want to convey to others into stories, uh, debating, turning uh, again, the kind of thinking we want to do into an argument or a debate uh, or um, a sort of uh, lively confrontation or, or conversation among people. And then finally, teaching other people. Um, I think we've all had the experience of learning something better ourselves when we teach it to someone else. This is a technique that can be incorporated into uh, the classroom with, with peers teaching their class, with uh, students teaching their peers, their classmates or into the workplace where you have, um, you can even set up what's known as a cascading mentorship where there's several levels, you know, the, the top people, um, the most experienced te people teach um, a sort of middle tier who then teaches um, the novices or the newcomers. And everyone in that case is benefiting from that teach to learn um, effect. And I, I did pull out at, at the very bottom there um, of this slide, the fact that stories, again, going back to stories, they are known at, to be psychologically privileged. That's a word that psychologists use to describe stories. Our brains are wired to understand information in a story format. Um, we listen to them more attentively. We understand them more thoroughly. We remember them more accurately. And we're more likely to act on uh, information that is contained within a story than information that is that is presented in a more expository kind of format. So uh, the more we can incorporate storytelling, this sort of ancient human art into the work that we do in our modern workplaces, um, the better. So I want to just mention here the, the value of group thinking, which is um, something we've often struggled to do over the past two years during the pandemic. You know, there are very primitive and visceral kinds of mechanisms that allow groups of people to blur a bit the um the the distinctions and the separations between us that are that that seem so permanent and solid you know um in everyday life things like synchronous movement you know moving in the same way at the same time as other people um, engaging in rituals, having emotional experiences together. These are hard things to do uh, virtually. And I'm hoping that once we're able to join each other again in person, we can create these group situations where a collective intelligence emerges that is greater than, than sort of the sum of its parts. Yeah. So this is just sort of a summation of what I've been saying. Um, my own pitch for why the extended mind is so valuable and so important it gives us so many choices beyond just flogging the brain and working the brain ever harder. It allows us to transcend those limits of the biological brain, which really would otherwise limit what we can do um, because they are just built in limits to all of our brains that we can get beyond as long as we're skillfully using external resources. And it is um, something we can learn. It's not something that's taught or uh, emphasized in our current educational system or in our current workplace, but I think there needs to be a change. I, um, I think we need a paradigm shift away from uh, focusing solely on the biological brain and opening ourselves up to the possibilities of the extended mind. Um, so I think my last slide has some information. Yes. So I'd love to hear from you if you want to get in touch. And right now, I think we have a few minutes for questions. So thanks so much for listening to my spiel and, uh, now there you are. So you'll you'll tell me what people are asking. Why? Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's incredible the amount of information and value you packed <laughs> in the forty five minutes there. It's a great primer for the book as well. So so thank you. Hi. Hi. Hey, Annie. Listen, I absolutely love the book. I love that you're so brave, sort of bringing these conversations forward. I loved. I read an interview with you about how much you love post it notes. And yeah, one of the things, and, and I'm really curious because it's something I work a lot with. So a lot of my clients, they're overthinkers. But whenever mm. I bring in an exercise to do with post-it notes, mm -hmm. it's almost like something happens. And we know that intuitively, but I'm just curious, apart from the DNA study, what, what specific studies and things have you found that proves to us why it works so well? You talk about moving from thinking to navigating. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that? I love it. Sure, sure. I'm so glad to hear that that seems to be a, a good strategy for use with your with your own clients. I, I as I say, I'm a huge um, post-it note fan myself, and there are several reasons um, suggested by research for why it does work so well. One is simply that um, we have limited bandwidth, you know, for keeping information inside our heads, 
And as long as we do keep it inside our heads, we're having to burden ourselves with the, with simply remembering that stuff, you know? So um, as soon as we put it down onto, onto space, put down that burden on and um, uh, cognitively offload our ideas onto post-it notes, we free up bandwidth that then we, then we can devote to these sort of higher uh, cognitive capacities, like imagining and planning and conceptualizing that before we're used up in part by just simply remembering. Um, there's also um, a kind of a effect that, that kicks in when we take ideas out of our heads and put them onto physical space, like, like post-it notes, we get, we put a dis, a bit of distance between ourselves and our ideas. And, um, that's hard to, uh, obtain. It's hard to, um, to achieve when all those ideas are in our heads. Once they're out in the world, we can apply our senses to them. We can see them. We can speak them out loud and hear what they sound like. We can move them around. I think there's something about the physical dynamism of again getting our bodies involved and moving our bodies and and you know um, not having it be this soporific kind of like I'm just sitting here thinking, but now you're dynamically doing something. And again, as I was saying, these embodied resources come into play where um, your spatial memory can um, can can um, be involved. You you remember you put this stuff over here and this stuff over there. It's just like it opens up all these possibilities for thinking that are wasted, effectively wasted when um, all of those ideas remain inside your head. Awesome. Hi, writer. Thank you, Niall, and thank you, Annie, for the very very interesting talk. Mm -hmm. uh, my questions regarding the idea of serious play, which is <laughs> that meeting between a uh, game and reality and that uh transcending that sensibility transcendence that an active anagage for example tai chi tuan or acting uh, in scandinavia they have what's called jeep force uh, mm. so i was curious how that really ties into your idea of gesture and motion mm. previously talked about mm. uh, and participatory and perspectival knowing as john verveke likes to call it yeah oh that's so interesting and i have to say i have not really thought very much about serious play but now that you mention it it fits into so much of, of what the extended mind would argue. You know, for example, as you, as you say, play often involves the body, involves gesture and movement. Um, it, um, it's, it's often social, of course, and we do, we, we play with other people. Um, and I think there might even be a piece related to, um, to this, to our setting, to our environment, that um, when we feel like we're playing a game rather than doing work, that kind of changes the whole meaning of of um, of what we're doing, and may give us access to to parts of ourselves that that would be suppressed if we were thinking, "Oh, well, here I am at work," you know. And that, to me, speaks to the um, the importance of context. Again, like you know, the brain is so context sensitive that. Um, telling ourselves that we're playing rather than working may put us in, in, a, in a completely different mode. Um, so I, I often think of, you know, to me, the extended mind, one of its implications is that instead of trying to force the brain to do what we want it to do, often the more effective approach is to change the context in which we're doing it. And you could think of being a teacher or being a manager as being a situation creator, a context creator, you know, and that makes, that's actually very exciting to me to think of um, a teacher or a manager creating a context that feels playful rather than, you know, dutiful, um, which is what we asso often associate with, with work. So I think for all those reasons, plus the stuff about, um, Groupiness. I don't think I, I mentioned that word before, but it's one of my favorites. Um, psychologists find that groups, teams differ on the extent to, to which um, they demonstrate what's known as groupiness, like a, a sense of being an entity rather than like a collection of individuals. And I think a game or play is a fantastic way to create that kind of groupiness rather than a sense of, um, of, of a bunch of individuals. And so my in turn give rise to that collective intelligence that we're looking for. So I think, I think serious play has a lot to recommend it and a lot of um, connections to the extended mind. Thanks for, for suggesting that. No problem. And thank you for the excellent answer. Okay. I have a, just a quick question um, about, mm -hmm. you're obviously a writer, a prolific writer going forward. Now, when you're, whenever you're writing your books in the future, how, how are the ideas that you've learned about and covered in this book going to change your approach to writing your next book? Yeah, yeah, that's a, an interesting question because 
you know, I often say that writers write what they need to learn uh, sort of unconsciously. Um, and I definitely needed to learn what was in, what turned out to be in the extended mind. I think I, I would say that I've long been a, quite a brain bound person. You know, I'm a freelance writer. I have been for many years. And so I work in a very solitary way, not necessarily with that kind of invigorating interaction with other people. Although I do, you know, I do interact with my editors now and then. Um, I very much had that um, assumption that the way to get work done is to sit down and, you know, keep pushing yourself until, um, until it's done. And I would say that I, I didn't really see how the body um, fa factored into all of that. I very much live in my head and live kind of above the neck above, above from, from the neck above. Um, but, um, but I, my mind was really changed by what I, I discovered in the writing of this book. And I, I did apply it in the writing of this book. I, I used my post-it notes quite a lot because it was a very complex kind of um, organizational structure that I needed to, to draw on all the resources that I could to, um, to help me map out the book. Um, I did um, try to bring other people into the writing of this book more than I have in the past and found that very helpful. And I also, you know, the last year of writing the book um, coincided with the, the COVID epidemic. And so I found, found myself going outside quite a bit more and I adopted a habit of, um, of taking a bike ride each afternoon. And I really found that the combination of physical activity, forward movement, which is a kind of, you know, I didn't get to talk about this, but um, the mind really thinks in metaphors and the, uh, the, for, the sort of forward movement or, or fluid kind of movement is one reason why so often we get our best ideas when we're walking or biking or being physically active. So uh, I, I would research and report and write in the morning and then in the late afternoon, take a bike ride. And I would always find that that was the moment when all the ideas came together. Um, whether that was the attention restoration effect of being outside, or as I say, this sort of um, embodied metaphor of movement, or perhaps it was the, um, the physical activity kind of awakening my brain and, and putting me in a mode where I could think differently and better. I don't know, but um, that's certainly, those are all habits that I intend to, to keep and to apply the next time I write a book. First of all, um, thank you very much for that amazing talk. That was awesome. Um, and I'd just like to ask you a question um, regarding therapy. Um, mm -hmm. Given sort of um, your research into the extended mind, um, what do you think the optimal conditions would be for therapy and, and therapeutic change? I know traditionally you've kind of seen therapy done in a quite a personal one-to-one -one seated position um, mm -hmm. or even traditionally in a psychodynamic, sad, psychodynamic way where you'd actually be turned away from the client. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess this research into the extended mind suggests a very different approach to mm. therapeutic input. Um, mm -hmm. So I'd just like to hear your thoughts on how that would look, please. Yes, thanks very much for that question, Ryan. I'm very interested in therapy and, um, uh, and I've never quite pondered therapy from an extended mind point of view, but I think what the extended mind would have to say about that is first of all, that being in person would be, um, greatly preferable to, to conducting therapy online. Although I know that um, for many people, that's, that's the only option. And it's certainly better than not having therapy in that case. But um, I also think that the Freudian kind of, as you say, the, the very traditional psychodynamic approach of having the person on the couch while the, and not in view of the, um, of the therapist might be problematic as much as I like the idea of sort of listening to your own unconscious rather than, you know, having to um, grapple with the reactions of the, of the therapist. I think there's an argument contained within the extended mind for that face-to-face -face contact. And what I'm thinking of in particular is a phenomenon known as social interoception. So we, I talked about how you're, we're, we can tune into our own internal sensations, but that can also happen in an inter interaction with another person that by, um, you know, when we speak to another person face to face, we unconsciously and automatically and very subtly sort of mimic their facial expressions and posture and gestures. And we, but by doing so, we kind of um, generate a little bit of what they're feeling inside our own bodies. And by tuning into that, 
we can get a sense of what they're feeling. And therapists are really the champions of this. You know, they are trained actually to pay attention to what's going on in their own bodies to give them a sense of what the client is feeling and maybe can't say or isn't saying. Um, so that kind of um, just the richness of those signals that are ex exchanged between two people who are sitting uh, across from each other in person and the flow of that information between them, I think is an ideal setting for, um, for psychotherapy. Um, but, but the idea of, of connecting the extended mind to therapy is so interesting. And I, I thank you for, for bringing that up. You. I think that's the next book. You can move forward. Cool, cool, cool possibly, after. possibly. I'll happily, I'll happily, happily collaborate if you need someone. Um, okay. I don't know how much I'll be able to contribute, but I'll try. <laughs> thank you. Awesome. Cheers, Ryan. Yeah, Annie, thank you so much for a, a brilliant presentation. Um, yeah, a thank you to everybody that's tuned in today, spending half a day on Sunday learning about uh, consciousness and psychology just fair play that's that's quite a it's just, it's just a great thing to be doing thank you Niles, and and thank you all this is really a really a pleasure thanks all right see you soon